Well, little was known of, of the cell's vast complexity in Darwin's day. And, uh, and in fact, Darwin stated this. He said, If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down, but I can find out no such case. So he, look at what he says. If, if, it can be, if an organ can be found that cannot be developed through numerous successive slight modifications, he's talking over successive generations, that my theory would absolutely break down. Not suffer harm or require revision, but would absolutely break down. But, of course, in Darwin's day, they didn't know of the things we know today about the cell. And today, we know there are lots of things, lots of things that cannot be developed by numerous successive slight modifications. And for this, the molecular machines stand, stand as our best example. There are machines in cells that could not possibly have been formed over successive generations. Because every single part of the machine has to be there. Every single part has to be there at the exact same time. Same time, every single piece of the machine has to be put assembled together, and then you have to apply energy to it to get it to work. These molecular machines are, are tremendously complex. They are what we call irreducibly complex. Now, this is a fat term, so let me flesh this out for you. Irreducibly complex means it's so complex that it can't be reduced to individual components that serve a function. Michael Behe, uh, in his book, Darwin's Black Box, uh, popularized the term uh, irreducible complexity, and he, use, he uses a mousetrap as, as an example. A mousetrap, in comparison to molecular machines, is a very, 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 very simple machine. But even a mousetrap can't be, as, can't be assembled through numerous successive slight modifications and be functional at each stage. That's the, that's the rub. I mean, just because you have the base plate of the mousetrap doesn't mean it's a functional mousetrap. You have the base plates in the spring, it's still not a functional mousetrap. You have the base plate in the spring and the, hand, the, the striker is still not a mousetrap. You have to have every single component there at the exact same time. He describes irreducible complexity this way, Michael B. Uh, irreducible complex system is a single system which is composed of several interacting parts that contribute to the basic function and where the removal of any one of the parts causes the system to effectively cease functioning. Every part has to be there. You can't remove even one and have it continue to function. An irreducibly complex system cannot be produced by gradual, uh, gradually by slight successive modifications of a precursor system, one that came before, since that precursor to an irreducibly complex system is by definition non-functional. These molecular machines will only function if every single part is there at the exact same time, if every single part is assembled together, and then you have to apply energy to it for it to work. Well, we have find lots of these molecular machines that simply cannot be built in this way through numerous successive slight modifications. For example, these molecular machines, like the kinesin shown here, a little walking robot. This is a nanoscale micro-robot that's carrying a package of manufactured goods down one of the highways of the cell. Uh, in this case, that highway is a microtubule. I'm going to be referring back to those again. But let me show you something. What I've shown you here in this video was one little walking robot carrying one little package of manufactured goods down one of these highways. But when I call them a highway, I mean they're like a highway. Look at, look at this. Now, you've got to look close to see the material that's being transported from one side of the cell to the other side of the cell. Now, if you look closely, you can see a whole bunch of little dots that are all being transported. See, what you have is not a highway. We're talking an interstate. This is stuff being transported from the cell on the right, that it picked up from the cell on the right, all the way across the cell in the center, and uh, transporting it to the cell on the left. I mean, you got an interstate full, of, I mean, armies of delivery vehicles, like I described them, is the truth of it. We have uh, molecular machines that are involved with m moving things inside of cells. We also have uh, machines that are responsible for processes like cell division. Uh, these are, this is sped up, but these are cells preparing 
to divide the DNA that's in the nucleus. And every little twitchy thing you see going on, those are all molecular machines preparing this cell for division. It first has to get rid of the nuclear membrane, and it has to organize all the chromosomes that are there into these tight structures. Once it gets them all organized, it lines them up all, all along the axis of the cell. As soon as it gets them lined up, it'll pull them apart to, the, to what will then be two new daughter cells. It reforms the nuclear membranes, It'll put a cell wall down in front of those two cells. Molecular machines are responsible for all of this work. Molecular machines are also used to, for the movement of cells, not just movement of stuff in cells, but movement of cells. This is a type of single cell organism called a ciliate. It's covered in these microscopic hairs that are motors. So these are molecular motors, motorized hairs, that it uses to swim with in its aqueous environment, but also uses to eat. I uh, missed the scene. Let me show you this one more time. Watch this. Uh, if you watch closely, you can see this little guy eating. I was trying to speed that up for you guys. I'm just out to restart it. So it has these motor proteins that cover it on the outside, and it uses these to swim, but it also uses them to eat. Now, if you watch closely... I'll, I'll tell you when it's coming in this next little scene. You can see it eat a piece of algae right here. So it, that, that those motor proteins were used to channel that algae into its mouth as well. Now these hairs that are called cilia move in a wave-like manner. It's a core, very coordinated wave-like manner like when people are doing the wave in a stadium. To illustrate that, look at this. This is another single-cell organism and you can see those hairs moving in that wave-like manner. This is a... But, Look at this, this is a single cell organism though that even has what looks like a head. You know? But these are this is a microbe that lives inside the guts of termites. That uh, hmm, helps that termite destroy your house. So. Well, here's what those hairs look like, those cilia. So these are these motor proteins that are like little hairs that all move in a very coordinated manner. And these are specifically though lung cilia. So we Cilia exist on the outside of these single cell organisms, but we also have cilia in our lungs that make your lungs self-cleaning. You have cells that line your bronchioles that secrete mucus, you know, the stuff that... Uh, so they secrete mucus, and then they have these cilia that constantly move the mucus up and out of your lungs to keep your lungs self-cleaning. So when we breathe in air, the particulates in the air will get stuck to the mucus, and the cilia bring the mucus up into your esophagus where you swallow it. And actually, lots of organisms have such things. Um, clams uh, do something similar. Clams have, uh, they, will, they breathe in water, and so air, so they breathe in, or they're filter feeders, they will suck in water, and the particulates in the water will get stuck to mucus, similarly, and then cilia will bring that mucus and any of that detritus, that debris that they brought in, to their mouth where they swallow it. So they use cilia to be uh, filter feeders in water. Well, you may not know, but... Uh, but you're also filter feeders to, in, to some extent. You know, most of the uh, dust particles in our house, like uh, if you ever see a, a, sun, a beam of sunshine come through your house, you see all those dust particles or, or those who have... Most of the dust particles in your house are actually dead skin cells. Yeah. So you're a, you're a filter feeder, uh, a bit of a cannibal, if you didn't know, feeding on the dead skin cells of the members in your household. Mm, it's true. You know, it's a... Interesting stuff we learn in biology, for sure it is. Well, here's a, let me show you what these cilia look like and how they work a little bit. Here's a cross-section of those cilia. And you see those, there's like nine sets of these two little tubes. You see those? So those are microtubules. Let me remind you what microtubules are. It's a multifunctional, multifunctional molecule. Microtubules were what this kinesin was walking down. That what was a microtubule that that uh, that kinesin is walking down. That's a microtubule. Microtubules were also what was being what pulls apart the chromosomes during cell division. Those are also microtubules. And in this case, the microtubules are a structure of protein that are being used here in the cilium. You got one pair of microtubules in the center. Nine pairs go around the outside edge. This is a three-dimensional engineering diagram that was created by the National Library of Medicine. They call these molecular diagrams engineering diagrams because that's what they are. In order to illustrate the various parts that make up these molecular machines, you have to create an engineering diagram. 
But there you see the microtubules, and let me show you how this works. So the side-by-side wave-like motion of the psyllium is due to the cooperative interaction of several proteins in addition to the microtubules. Let me circle a couple of them up for you here. Uh, the proteins called dienes, shown there, are important in this process. And there's another one called annexin that is shown there. I'm going to show you what these do. So these dienes are motor proteins that will reach over, grab onto the neighboring microtubule, and push down on, the, uh, on it to generate motion. And, uh, but... Uh, they would slide, slide past each other, as shown here, if not for the nexins. What the nexin protein does is it locks those, peri, those pairs of microtubules together so that instead of one of them sliding down, the whole structure bends together. Well, Michael Behe, again, we met him before, a professor at Lehigh University, describes the, the, uh, the, the cilia as, a, as a irreducibly complex. He says this. What components are needed for the cilium to work? Ciliary motion certainly requires microtubules, otherwise there would be no strands to slide. Additionally, it requires the diene, the motor proteins, or else the microtubules of the cilium would lie stiff and motionless. Furthermore, it requires the linkers, the nexins, to hold onto neighboring strands and converting the sliding motion into bending motion and preventing the structure from falling apart. All of these are required to perform one function, ciliary motion. Another important molecular machine is shown here. This is the ATP synthase. Now, this is a turbine engine, and there's no other way to describe it. It's a turbine engine. And, uh, but this engine is made up of 500 separate protein subunits. Each of those little balls you see there is a separate protein. 500 individual proteins are necessary to form this massive molecular machine. And this thing is of such importance to the cell that the discoverers of this motor were awarded the Nobel Prize in 1997. Now what this machine makes is uh, this important molecule we call ATP. ATP is made from the breakdown of carbohydrates. Plants make carbohydrates in photosynthesis. We eat plants to get those carbohydrates because it's an energy carrier. But it's a big energy carrier, and cells only need little bits of energy. And so what it does is it takes that carbohydrate, and it breaks it down and makes a whole bunch of these from it, ATPs. And uh, ATPs are provide the energy for all cellular processes. Muscle contraction gets its energy from ATP. Nerve impulse gets its energy from ATP. If a cell needs to transport something through the membrane from one side to another, it gets that energy from ATP. To understand its importance, an average cell in the human body uses about 10 million ATPs per second. And you consume and remake half your body weight in ATP every day. Cyanide, poisons like cyanides, which break, block ATP synthesis, will kill you in 30 seconds. That's how important ATP is. All processes in cells are, uh, get their energy from this molecule. Well, the ATP synthase turbine engine is found in one of the many factories of the, ce- of the cell, at one of these organelles, and this one's uh, the one we call the mitochondria. Now, this factory not only houses these engines, thousands and thousands of them, but also an entire army of enzymes that catalyze the breakdown of glucose. Let me impress upon you how complex these chemical reactions really are. Part of the chemical reaction that's necessary to break down glucose and make ATP is shown here. And like I say, this is just part of it. This is the the part that's called the citric acid cycle. But... I want to show you what's happening here. Um, it's kind of difficult to read this, but as you go around this circle, these, what you see are a bunch of enzymes that are responsible for this. At the very top, citrate is uh, converted by the enzyme aconitase into isocitrate. Isocitrate is converted by the enzyme isocitrate dehydrogenase to alpha-ketoglutarate. Alpha-ketoglutarate is, mod- is changed by alpha-ketoglutarate dehy- dehydrogenase to succinyl-CoA. And on and on and on and on. 
All of those enzymes are necessary to accomplish the breakdown of glucose. And if you look closely, you will see carbon dioxides given off. Uh, I can't, I can't really point to them over here. I'll lose my mouth. But let's see if I can see. There's one carbon dioxide right there, another carbon dioxide right there. Those are the carbon dioxides we breathe off. You need oxygen to power this chemical reaction, and you breathe off carbon dioxide from the breakdown of glucose. Okay, But what all of this is really doing is making these other molecules, that NADH, it's making that NADH molecule, another NADH molecule, which are themselves proton carriers. Because it's protons that power this molecular machine. Unlike our machines that are driven by a flow of electrons, electricity, this machine is driven by a flow of protons. So as as protons flow through this machine, it it spins. And it spins at an amazing rate of 7,000 revolutions per minute. And with each revolution, it makes three ATPs. So to reiterate how complex this is, to make ATP, the cell must have all of those enzymes necessary to metabolize glucose. Plus, it needs to have thousands of those ATP synthase molecules in those mitochondria, which have, uh, again, 500 individual protein subunits to make one ATP synthase. But uh, it also requires ATP. So to make ATP... You have to have all of those enzymes, you have to have ATP synthase, and you have to have ATP as well. Kind of a problem. Well, another molecular machine is the flagellum. Similar to the cilia, except instead of an organism being covered by those hairs, it has just a couple of them, often at one end, and it spins. Rather than bending back and forth like the cilia do in that wave-like manner, the flagellum spins. So it's like an outboard motor that spins. You could see it kind of letting it out and come back. Here's another one. I'll show you a different one. There's another flagellate, uh, a single-cell organism with the flagellum uh, spinning its flagellum, pulling itself through the water there. Well, these are... Uh, eukaryotic single cell organisms. Bacteria, though, also have a flagellum. Let me show you bacteria. These are bacteria swimming with their flagellum. And they're, they're, in, these are moving incredibly fast. At some point, I did a, a calculation to figure out how fast they were running. Uh, move, they're moving close to what I said, uh, <clears throat> bacteria, they're able to swim at speeds of up to 60 cell lengths per second which uh, is comparable to like 164 miles per hour, if you compare that to like a cheetah that uh, travels 25 body lengths uh, and tr- 68 miles per hour. So anyway, I did some calculations to figure out how fast the bacteria were, were swimming because they were swimming so fast. And I, I, whenever I watch this video, I always get, uh, I, I, I always feel bad for the one that's stuck right there. You know, one I'm stuck on the slide. And he's like, he's like, his buddies keep just swimming right past him and don't even give him a nudge. Hey, come on, dude. Give me a nudge. I'm stuck here, spinning around. Yeah, well. So bacteria also have a flagellum. <clears throat> and the flagellum is itself, again, a nanomachine. A nanoscale machine. This one is built using information from approximately 50 different genes. And is composed of uh, 40 or more proteins, depending on the species. Some of these range in, are just in a few copies. Others, like the, the proteins that make up that long filament, are, exist in tens of thousands of copies. Now, bacteria construct this uh, complex nanoscale structure more efficiently than any human design process can. And the flagellum is a machine, and everyone recognizes this. Even a, a flagellar expert, uh, David Rosier, in the prestigious journal The Cell, describes the flagellum this way. He said the flagellum resembles a machine designed by humans. If it resembles something that's designed, probably was designed, but... Uh, see, they see designs. They see them, and they remark about them, but they won't admit to them being actual designs. But the flagellum is the world's smallest rotary propulsion system. And it has all the parts we, we place in our motors. It's constructed of proteins uh, instead of like metals or 
alloys or plastics, but those, those proteins all have different functions. <clears throat> Some serve as the rotary motor. There are other proteins that serve as bushings. There's a drive shaft. There's a rotation switch regulator. There's a universal joint. And uh, then it has that helical propeller. Uh, and I mean, it has all the components we put in our machines. In every way, it truly resembles a machine designed by humans, like, the, like David Rosier said. Well, evolutionists often argue that the flagellum, though, wasn't designed, but simply evolved. And they argue that it evolved through a process called co-option, that uh, the cell used parts that were already in the cell and just made something new or novel from those. However, this argument falls flat because of the flagellum's 40 proteins, 40 different proteins, 30 of them are completely unique to the flagellum. There are a few proteins that are used for other things within the cell, but the majority of the proteins that we find in the flagellum are unique to the flagellum. Now, I want to return and remind you of Ernst Haeckel and uh, his Monerans that he fraudulently made up, which he described as simple little lumps of mucus and not composed of any organs at all. See, bacteria, the bacterial kingdom was originally placed in the kingdom Monera, the name that Ernst Haeckel gave to his fraudulently created simple cells. I think the bacterial kingdom was named Monerans as an homage to Ernst Haeckel. But it's interesting that since, since we learned the, bacter the bacterial kingdom when I was in college was the kingdom Monera. Since then, they've been renamed to Archaebacteria and Eubacteria. But it is interesting that the cell that they thought was so simple that they called it a Monera come to find out was in possession of the most complex molecular machine we know of. And now bacteria are tiny, much smaller than other cells. But being small does not mean you're more simple. You know, when you miniaturize something, that's more difficult. You know, the difference between our big PCs and our laptops, our laptops are not more simple because they're small, they're more complex. That's why they're more expensive than a big PC that has the same capabilities, right? 